Boa tarde. Good afternoon. I'll address you in English so it will be more comfortable for everybody. Um, this is both a immense pleasure and an honor uh, to be speaking and borrowing uh, the example from uh, an extraordinary man that the four, the five of us had the, the privilege to, in different degrees, um, to cross lives with. And in an era where in everyday experiences we find that we are in such a void of uh, inspiring leaderships at all levels, business, political, uh, sports, even as a parent, even as a father, so many times we don't know what to do. Unfortunately, we were not born with the formulas to be parents, or fortunately. So we can learn from each other's experiences. And that's what we are going to do this afternoon. And um, it's, it's going to be Madiba's way. It's going to be sharing and borrowing from each other, not in a formal way. It was never in a formal way to be with him. Um, um, we'll have th this panel. I think they are familiar to all of you, but I will do from left to right. I will present them to you. First, Chelo Atang is the CEO from uh, Nelson Mandela Foundation in Johannesburg. He's got broad shoulders. <laughs> he, has, he has to carry the, the burden of keeping uh, alive the values of Nelson Mandela and all his patrimony, uh, uh, physical and, and uh, as a standing and ethics. President Sampaio needs no presentation besides um, being an ex, a former president of Portugal, he was the recipient of first United Nations Nelson Mandela Prize in 2015, um, and it speaks by itself. Um, on my right, uh, Mark Maraj, he, um, he knew Madiba from prehistory. Uh, it's um, he, um, he, uh, he stayed in prison in Robben Island with him. He is a good uh, storyteller as well, um, and will borrow a bit of his sense of humor dealing with uh, the, the toughest questions. And Pripak uh, Prenarayan, it's a, a very well-rounded business person who will share with us what is the experience of uh, um, bringing alive uh, Madiba's experience into our days. Uh, business activities. I'll first ask uh, uh, President Sampaio to um, address us just uh, what he thinks that we could borrow from his own eyes for today's life from Madiba's legacy. Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here uh, in Estoril. Um, it's a very difficult point you raise because we are confronted with an extraordinary figure of the 20th century, hoping that uh, his uh, struggle throughout his life and his values, his tenacity, his courage will be of influence in uh, the 21st century when it's badly needed. And therefore, I would, uh, first of all, uh, uh, say that uh, what impresses me more, has always impressed, is in fact, in confronted with the most serious problems, uh, uh, his tenacity, his uh, courage, and his uh, political vision stood above everything. And to have gone through uh, a jail period of so many, so long years, coming out and, in fact, uh, addressing uh, uh, the need for a, a pluralistic society, uh, he was not alone, fortunately for him, but it would not have been possible without his charismatic leadership. That's one thing. The second thing which impresses me that he's endured throughout his life a very great uh, attention to the most fundamental causes uh, and uh, debates and fights uh, for liberty, for human rights, uh, uh, for uh, uh, the fight against tuberculosis, the fight against uh, HIV, especially in his own country, which was a great, of great importance. So here you have a combination of uh, an extraordinary leader and at the same time someone 
with the concrete mm. has the possibility to, uh, after s such a big sacrifice, to combine this uh, suffering uh, and pick it up and, in fact, not leave uh, the great uh, vision which, in fact, he uh, took throughout times. And, of course, when a country has a charismatic person who understands what is at stake and fights for, uh, it's not the beginning of his fight, in fact, but he adapted and so on and understood that to apply the values that he thought were essential for the future of his own country. And of course, now it's to the future of Africa, uh, uh, the future of mankind. So from a, uh, a country a vision, he has become obviously a worldwide figure of, of great importance. And so I think this uh, debate with these personalities here today who knew him well, much better than I did, uh, we had a phrase in common that, in fact, uh, uh, President Mandela was uh, perhaps one of the figures who um, was very, very happy with the, and did quite a lot to help the cause, the independence of East Timor. It's not very, very well, very much mentioned, but he played a role in that. And uh, I, uh, I went to South Africa to visit him on, on, in this respect. It was an unforgettable uh, task uh, that he took over. But so, uh, let's uh, debate. So the only thing I think is, I would just like to finish by saying that we need in this time of crisis, uh, crisis everywhere, how on earth are we going to maintain uh, optimism? How on earth are we going to maintain the capacity to struggle? How on earth are we going to be attentive to what is going on and what is permanent and what is accidental? Uh, uh, and this is the distinction is essential because if we do not have it, uh, values to which we really go through and obey, respect, fulfill, we are lost. So, in fact, I, I finish this part by, with two quotes uh, from one which I think is fantastic from one of his uh, books, uh, and I quote, the greatest glory in living lies not in never failing, but in rising every time we fail. I think this, uh, it's, it, it's a permanent stimulus which can be of great use today. And the other one is his dedication to education. Uh, the way he understood that education was essential uh, for uh, everything that happened afterwards. Uh, uh, sustainable development goals, uh, and before that, the, those who stood before. And uh, another quote of which I will, which is, it's a lesson for a lifetime, really. Uh, he also said, I have walked that long road to freedom. I have tried not to falter. I have made missteps along the way. But I have discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. I think this uh, encompasses, in fact, a great vision mm. uh, of uh, our story uh, in the world of today, and before and after. It's amazing how we foreign journalists that were traveling every day with Mandela, how we would get puzzled every day, as the president just referred, uh, with his humbleness. Uh, the way that he every day was raising everybody around him, all the time worried with the weakest ones around him, and always having this attitude, we are as strong as the weakest around us, and all the time practicing this. I'll invite uh, Cello, which, as I mentioned, is the CEO for Nelson Mandela Foundation, to try to shade some to, to enlighten us, how can we do it in our days? Thank you very much. Uh, it, uh, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, the, um, it's an absolute honor to be here, and uh, His Excellency, thank you very much. It's an honor to be spending time with you. Uh, our ambassador to South Africa is here. Thank you very much for joining us. I think for, for, for me, I want to uh, first observe that uh, 
looking at uh, my fellow panelists, I, I, I was hoping there would be a woman uh, in Mecca. I think Madiba would have uh, quipped about something like this. I will put on a dress next time. Yeah, I think he would have, he would have actually chosen to even have an Archbishop Tutu with a dress, uh, <laughs> just to make sure that we, 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 we have that. But I, I think it, I want to start off where um, His Excellency ended. Um, the world finds itself where it is today, mainly <clears> because uh, after climbing that hill, and he says that uh, continuing that quote, that uh, you, 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 one needs to take a break, look back, and see that there are this many valleys to cross and many mountains to climb, but that he says we may dare not linger. Uh, because the long walk ahead is still very long. And I think it's, uh, it's that that we need to take, uh, take away, that we are where we are because we lingered. Uh, we gave o over power to uh, politicians, we gave power to corporates, we, the, the citizens uh, end, ended up not uh, wrestling power and making sure that they make change uh, to be what they want it to be. But going back to what I understand Nelson Mandela to be is um, it's a difficult thing. Uh, one is, is trapped into thinking that he was one thing and one <coughs> thing only. Uh, that uh, you'd, you'd, you'd be trapped into thinking he was one of the greatest leaders who listened to everybody, who was uh, about consensus. Who, but there are just as many examples of the contrary, uh, of him uh, just uh, being a dictator too, uh, who wouldn't listen. Um, and, uh, and one who uh, you'd always say, no, he, he led from behind. I think there were moments when Madiba enjoyed being in the front, uh, leading from the front too. So uh, these are, are things that uh, we, we need to not oversimplify Madiba. Mm -hmm. We need to take him f with his complexity. Um, it's his complexity that makes him special. Uh, in fact, uh, it's when we appreciate that complexity that we begin to understand the man. Um, you know, the, the, the rejection that you have at the moment from young people, uh, some sectors of young people, of this uh, pure Madiba, even though he himself said, and uh, I, I paraphrase him, about how um, one of the regrets he had while he was in prison it was this uh, false image that he unwittingly projected to the outside world of being a saint. And he said, I was never one even on the basis of a, a, a saint, an earthly definition of a saint <coughs> as a sinner who keeps on trying. And it's that keeping on trying that we need to also be looking into to say, he, he was a sinner too, who kept on trying. Um, and that rejection, I go back to the point about young people and how they reject this sainthood. Um, we've, we felt recently with uh, the passing of Mam Winnie Martizala Mandela, when uh, suddenly there were those who were vilifying her. Um, because the, the world can only operate in two extremes. You are either a villain or a hero. And uh, in the case of Mamwini, she was uh, made, turned into this villain initially. And uh, when people took over the, the, the story, they said, actually, this Madiba that you think was special could also be a villain too. And I think uh, if we can do anything uh, at this conference, is to try and uh, not oversimplify Madiba, but understand the complex Madiba, and in the process say, how can we understand the key principles that I take as a CEO, as a, a leader in my organization, and then how do I apply them in their simplicity to ensure that we can bring back values, build values-based societies and organizations that are values-based, uh, that we try and observe the legacy by being the legacy and that we try and find the Madiba in ourselves. And you define that. Um, we found, uh, we, I was just telling Antonio earlier on that we, we, we're writing, in the process of writing a little booklet on Madiba's leadership. We found that it's difficult to just put him down to seven principles of an effective leader. Seven uh, principles of this, it doesn't fit neatly in those. In fact, Mac can tell a story of how the Nelson Mandela Foundation, at a huge cost, underwent a process to try and understand Madiba uh, that way. We ended up giving up on that project because we thought he's too complex to be boxed into just the, he was either this or that. And I think uh, um, uh, for all of us, if there's anything that this conference can take away is 
let's appreciate the gray areas of a great leadership because all of us have those. Thank you, Chela. Um, Mac. Mac is, uh, is uh, a living proof of all that we've been uh, going around Madiba. And um, I'll borrow from his sense of humor if he allows me to, to tell us Madiba had the sense of humor, uh, even dealing with all of this stony face when he had trouble with life. How we, would he move facing the, the toughest moments? Where do, would he borrow strength from? I'm not so sure that I can provide an adequate answer, but let me start by, first of all, saying that I'm very mindful that today we are having a conversation with people who are mainly drawn from the business sector. And it is important that we should draw on experiences of Madiba to understand why he is also relevant in the way we conduct business. The second point I would like to make is that I agree entirely with the former president when he says currently the world is in a crisis. I would go further to say, in fact, there is a democracy of a crisis. Democracy is in crisis. That people are beginning to lose faith and feel marginalized, and that this has opened up a space for people who are demagogues, really, to play on our fears of the future and raise those fears to make us more afraid of each other. And that crisis affects business very deeply because it may not immediately affect your specific enterprise. But the world we live in is critical for the way in which you are going to contribute to the development of society. Now, I'm saying this in response because I'm asked, what are those issues that Mandela drew strength from? There is no single type of issue from which he drew strength. He drew strength from events that were extremely painful. And he's on record that he went to prison and from the very first week, having been sentenced now for life plus five years, we used to joke that, you see, he's got to first finish the life, then he'll start the five years. But he says, I decided at that very moment that I'm going to come out of this prison intact. It did not matter what torture, what psychological pressure he would be subjected to. What was he isolating? Remarkably, in the constitution of South Africa that was negotiated, the interim constitution, negotiated by the multi-parties, 26 parties, we drafted a Bill of Rights. And after the preamble of equality, the first right we put was the right to life. And the second right we put was the right to human dignity. Mm. When the final constitution was writ written by the elected representatives, made up of parliaments, both houses, suddenly the Bill of Rights had changed. It still had a preamble to equality. But the first right that it listed was the right to dignity. Yep. And the second one was the right to life. And colleagues, I've asked myself this question. I have phoned comrades who were involved in the process. I was involved in the interim process. I was partially involved in the final process, but others were more closely in the final. And I said, how did we change this? Why? None of them have been able to explain. The minutes don't explain it. 
And I put it to you to think about that. Because you see, the 26 representatives who devised the one that said the right to life is number one were arguing logically. They were self-appointed leaders. And they said, you can't have dignity without first having life. So it was logical to put life first and then dignity. But when parliament, they elected people now for the first time from all walks of life, sat to deliberate, and they were majority black. Their first thing was the pain, the humiliation that they suffered every day. And so, without debating the question, they put dignity first. Because they said, life is meaningless if, it, if I don't have dignity. So Madiba then, with the pain of prison, turns around and he says, I decided I would come out intact no matter what they did to me. Because the one thing that I cannot be robbed of, he doesn't explain it in detail, but I will explain it. Because I've been through torture. They can strip me naked. Whether I want to or don't want to, they can strip me naked. They can beat me up whether I agree or not. But my dignity, they can only take away if I am complicit. If I cooperate, if I acquiesce to that. That is the one thing that I'm left with under the worst of conditions that they can't take away without my agreement. And therefore he said, I'm going to come out intact. That is how he turned what was going to be the most painful and long endurance that he would go through, the prison. He turned that to look at himself and say, Right, this is the strength of the enemy. They're gonna do everything possible to destroy me. What have I got that they cannot take away without my agreement? And I think that's a question you have to ask yourself in the world in which we live. What are the things that we're going to hold on to in order to build the future? We're not looking at a future that is just a rejection of the past. We are looking at a future that inherits all the good things that humankind has developed in its long march to freedom from the birth of humanity and how to move into that future. Mm. So that's, that's, I thought, in a very serious note and not lighthearted. I should start that way. And it is something that I haven't forgotten because there have been moments when I have been complicit in my captors robbing me of my dignity. And once you have succumbed to that, it is an extremely difficult fight back to regain your humanity and your dignity. Mr. President Narayan, can we borrow from you, from a business point of view, how can we learn from Madiba's heritage attitude towards our day's problem and challenges? I yet haven't got over what Mac had to say. You know, I yet got goosebumps. Anyway, thank you very much, Your Excellency, friends. I'm really humbled to be here today. <laughs> when Frank mentioned to me about the uh, session, I was wondering what am I going to be doing here in front of all these stalwarts, and particularly Mac, who has been a mentor to me and my good luck charm. Uh, I started going to South Africa 25 years ago plus, and during this period, I heard, met, read, spoke, and learned a lot from Madiba, Mac, and a few others. I came from a materialistic world, and the values were different. It was profits. What interaction brought was soul. And those are the very important lessons that came into some of the things that, in my journey over the last 25 years plus, is that 
business is also about your own people, and whether it had to do with negotiating for that matter. You know, it was a very important lesson that he taught that you negotiate, and if you want to conquer the world, you have to wait for your time and be patient. That was very important. Whereas, on the other hand, as Sello said, that Madiba was different when he started off life. He was tough, if I might use the word today in your presence, is that he was arrogant, he was short-tempered. But what he did during his prison term was to change himself with the introspection, which was that he became silent, he became a good listener. And in negotiation in business, he said, it's very important to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the person that you're dealing with. And if you deal with their strength, then the entire discussion becomes very different because it becomes participative. I might just touch another quality, which is very important, had to do with leadership. Now, in terms of leadership, there again, uh, Mac, this has to do with an incident with you. I go back to Robin Island, and Mac was known to be ratty. He was known to be difficult. He got instigated by the wardens for the easiest of reasons. And then Madiba called him, and he said, because each time he did that, his prison term got extended. And uh, Madiba called him, and he says, Mac, you are correct. You need to be a good listener. And what you need to do is that you don't allow anger to burn you. Just bide your time and make your point. And his prison terms were consequently managed. Because here was a lesson that Madiba had, is that you got to be a good listener, you got to be a good uh, participative, and you got to, so that was another learning that came, and here is a man who experienced that. Another thing that I think I found very interesting was the loyalty. I questioned myself, is that we look for loyalty in our structures from our employees, we give that an extra weightage compared to, well, let's say there is a difference between 18 20. And some of us give more importance to integrity and loyalty because that's an important thing. Now, how did Madiba generate that loyalty in terms of, I'll give you an instance again. I'm sorry, I'm coming back to Mac. And uh, because as I said that he and I have been very close for almost two and a half decades plus, is that there were times, and this is in Madiba's forward, which is in uh, the biography of Mac, and I think it's the, one of the best forwards, and if it's possible, we, you know, if the paper can be shared with you all, what Madiba wrote. He said that Mac was one of the most tortured human beings in the world. I won't go into details. But he said, during that time, Mac learned how to say that if you want to kill me, to the warden, you can kill me but nothing will come out of me. Now, how did this loyalty come about? It was for the state, it was for freedom, but it was also for the leader, because they knew that the leader stood by them. He gave them the freedom for decision-making and the entire value chain that existed. You know? So the, the, his chieftains felt confident, but here again, the loyalty that he encouraged. And you know, if I, with your permission, I'll just make one last point, and then maybe if you can consider between Cello and Mac and His Excellency, because I think he has a lot of anecdotes up his sleeve which will really <laughs> engage you. One last thing in which you can engage with Mac is that 27 years in prison that he was there, not Mac, but Madiba, <coughs> what was it that kept motivating him? What was it that kept him persistent to fight that battle? Was it his family? Or was it the way the family was humiliated? Was it the cause? And here again, I'm leading Mac to share something more that I believe uh, I'm conscious of, but I'd like to leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Unfortunately, I have to take him on. I don't like the words he's used calling me ratty. <laughs> and he has told the anecdote to my disadvantage. The truth is that 
when Mandiba told me that in my arguments with the warders, I should count 10, control my anger, pick my words. I said to him, but, but without that passion, I won't get through to the warder. And and he said, well, in that case, you can pretend you are angry. <laughs> and the problem is that I followed that lesson. I never got charged again in prison for a prison offense. But my problem today is that Madiba has messed my life. Because now, when I simulate anger, I don't know whether I'm simulating it or whether I'm really <laughs> angry. <laughs> so, so be careful. Be careful what you learn from Mandela. <laughs> Was that some Bakaria you no, wanted to address? I, I, I assume that I am speaking uh, uh, to a majority of uh, decision, business decision persons. Uh, what's uh, thinking of what uh, Mr. Mandela went through, uh, thinking about his values, what he stood for until the end. Uh, I think that present day present times are very contradictory in the sense that uh, there's a lot of development. Uh, globalization is here to stay and develop. But in fact, uh, inequality is still here. Uh, and it's not coming less, it's enlarging. And this is a very serious concern uh, to everyone, I would think. So I dare to say, uh, with all uh, respect and, uh, of course, prudence, that how are we going to find a democratic uh, uh, system in which you can combine development and equality, in which you can combine pluralism and integration, and all that you can say in this uh, kind of duet I'm trying to put forward. This is, I think, what he stands for today. Uh, I always imagine what on earth would he be doing if he was here today. Uh, eventually the same thing, of course, but with different colors, with different uh, attitudes, with different uh, components. And the great challenge of the business world, I take the liberty to say this with a certain cheek, I would say, uh, is that um, I think that we have to deliver a combination uh, of all these characteristics and do it at the same time. I mean, uh, when we are confronted with terrorism, violence, uh, uh, wars of all kinds, uh, uh, when uh, uh, there's a big difficult difficulty between what we think can be uh, a way in which uh, uh, international relations can be founded, and at the same time, the switches that uh, occur every day in affecting the need for a, a kind of compromise, uh, which is the only way in which I think uh, uh, we can honor his legacy in different times, in different uh, atmospheres. But uh, I don't think we can just develop for development. We have to develop with a human face. We have to develop with a with a kind of approach which uh, brings people in and not throws them out. Mm -hmm. And this is very difficult to do, uh, not only in internal national regimes, but also internationally. Uh, look at what is happening in the international world. Who knows what will be happening in, uh, well, what will happen in uh, 15 days' time with a, a nuclear ag agreement uh, with Iran. It's uh, obviously a very major thing, which obviously will affect everyone. But anyway, uh, so this combination is a great uh, justification for asking the business world, with all respect, to come into the far uh, and uh, uh, be active uh, in what can be their contribution, not only for development as such, uh, when you speak, of course, of uh, uh, budgets and uh, remittances and all that, uh, but at the same time, how can you make people live their own lives? Mm -hmm. How can you make people, in fact, uh, uh, be happy with what they have at stake? It's not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a great challenge. And I am, uh, with, of course, age going on, and uh, 
you are perhaps more moderate than you were when you were 20 years old or 25. <laughs> Someone in the audience might think this about me. But I'm more and more convinced that compromises are necessary. Uh, otherwise, you won't get there. Otherwise, you will always have this great, great difficulty of bringing people inside the system in the good way in which this has to be done. On that note, Cello, you coming uh, to Europe, you are flying to the States tomorrow, as, of, as far as I know. Which message you bring to business community, to civil society, to apply Madiba's legacy to our days? What can we do, really? How do we empower people? I think the... Educate them. It, I think it, that's important, yeah. It, it's education, but I, I, th I think there's two things that I... Uh, would be important in understanding Madiba as, as leaders. Um, the, the first one is uh, about consistency. You know, in one of the notes that he wrote, uh, he says there's two types of leaders you find. Uh, one who is uh, consistent, uh, whose word you can trust, um, who makes a big decision today, and you know that uh, um, you, he, he will stick uh, to that. And then the, the second type is the one who makes a big decision today and repudiates it the next day. And I think it's, in, it's important as leaders that we be aware of our consistency, that our people can trust our word, um, that even when you do change your mind, you, you change it having really applied it um, in a way that you've, you've now listened to to other people, and I want to give you an example uh, which uh, Mac can, can uh, s speak to also uh, about how he, he did make a, w one, once make a big decision and repudiated it the next day. Um, so when, when we got to our elections, 1993, uh, Madiba just uh, out of the blue stood up and said, 14-year-olds um, must uh, be able to vote. And uh, the, you, we, we've got a notebook in which he, you, you see him uh, writing in it, uh, observing what everybody says. So, uh, JZ, this was a reckless statement. TM, Tawambek, this is, shouldn't have been said, and he's not Joe Slovo. So he's writing what everybody says, and then he does what leaders don't do most of the time. He then writes, conclusion, I have made a grave error of judgment. This is Madiba at, the, at the, the prime of his fame. And I think it's important that the, the consistency that I'm talking about is one of, being, of having the humility to know I've made a mistake. And therefore, I now need to go and uh, um, address the media and apologize for that mistake. But the second one is uh, also knowing that that decision doesn't have to stand all because the leader said it. The second one that I want to, to give to you, um, uh, the, the message that I've been passing on, is again coming out of a letter that Madiba wrote in 1969. I was writing to his two daughters, and in the letter he starts off uh, with uh, what His Excellency said about education. Of course, most of his letters started like that. I mean, he was really passionate about education. And um, halfway through the letter, and I paraphrase him, he says, uh, um, I was happy to learn that you can now cook chips, rice, meat, and many other things. I'm looking forward to the day when I will be able to eat all that you cook. I hear that you're really sad that I'm not home, and you want to know when I will be back. I don't know, my darlings, when I will return. You remember that in a letter I wrote in 1966? I said that a white judge had said I should spend the rest of my living days in, in prison. I don't believe that's true. I'm looking forward to spending the, 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 the remaining life uh, with, with, you, with you in happiness. Then he concludes it by saying, don't worry about me now. I'm happy, I'm well, full of strength and hope. This is 1969. Madiba had only spent seven years in prison. He didn't know that he still had 20 more years to go in prison. And you find that consistency of the messaging around hope. And if there's one thing that, uh, all of us as leaders need to be doing is to give hope. Because if there's one thing that's missing in many people's life is hope. Um, people then become indifferent. People become apolitical because hope is missing. But it should be hope that has action too. 
that you, you sympathize, but saying, I am here with you to make sure that you can s succeed in your journey. For many um, who are hopeless, it's because life remains a draw of the lottery. They succeed because they, life just drew, they drew the, the, the right card. It should be our countries, should be corporates' responsibility to make sure that that happens. So I think it's an important thing that all of us need to then be walking away with. You read the challenge for Mac on that may, way there? May I just, I think that the conversation here is provoking certain thoughts. And I want to put a different perspective from looking at Madiba's legacy in terms of principles, which I agree with, but to see Mandela as a person who grew up over time and who developed, he was not really made born yeah. the way we see him. And it is challenges in life that shaped him and made him what we today admire. I've had the privilege of knowing him from around about 1956, 57, but more intimately from 1961, 62. And I have seen the changes going on in this man. And so, when Cello brings out the notes about the vote for 14-year-olds, in retirement, both of us agreed, decided to retire in 1999. And in retirement, we would meet from time to time and gossip, essentially. Although we said gossiping is for women in those <laughs> days. But we would gossip. You're going to wear a skirt the next yes, day. Yes. <laughs> and, and I said to him, hey, Madiba, what a mess you made when you fought for votes for 14 year olds. And he turned around and he says, no, it was not your people's logical arguments that changed my mind. You see, colleagues, what had happened is that there is a cartoonist yep. drew a cartoon of Mandela as a baby in napkins inside a pram sucking a bottle of milk and calling for votes for 14-year-olds. He says, when that cartoonist made a joke of me and my viewpoint, I changed my mind. Not because of your <laughs> argument. <laughs> I'm saying this because in our growth, we make mistakes. Not everything is state run. We don't do all the right things. And personally, I think we learn more from our mistakes. The embarrassment that lives on for us, which whenever you recall it in your privacy of your, of your bed alone, that's the time when you are able to blush and be honest <laughs> with yourself. But when I'm talking to you, I have a different version of the same story. So following that, what I'm struck by when I said to you that democracy is in a crisis, what the 24 years have taught me in South Africa and what Mandela did in his first administration, I'm struck by what he did about trying to entrench democracy in South Africa from the time we got power in 1904. Very few people write about it. Yet we're seeing in the world today that in one of the leading countries, most powerful in the world, questionable whether it's powerful because it depends on the criteria you use, but democracy is being challenged all the day, every day. And then I look at Mandela and I say, what do I learn from him in our 24 years? I learned that we have to keep searching for ways in what we say and what we do as leaders, whether in business or in politics or anywhere. We've got to keep interrogating ourselves in what we are saying and what we are doing. Is it deepening democracy? Because this is one of the most precious instruments that human society created since its evolution, democracy, where we can resolve our conflicts through dialogue and discussion and not without, and not killing each other. Now, the example I want to put here, and I think Sela will, will, will be able to respond to it too, is that in 1995, we hosted the World Rugby. The name of our national team was Springbok, which was all white all the years. 
And the team playing that day against the All Blacks was a South African team, primarily white. There was one black colored. The jersey that they were wearing and the name remained Springbok. And Madiba was saying, let's return that name. Rugby was like a religion for the white community. And when the teams lined up before the match started, suddenly Madiba walked in onto the field wearing the Springbok jersey with the number six on his back, which was the number of the captain. And he walked in to wish each team the best of luck. The audience, the crowd was 40,000, 90% white. And they burst out chanting, Nelson, Nelson, Nelson. Madiba was doing something that was against the experience of black people, the majority. We saw the name and the jersey as a symbol of discrimination. He saw it as an instrument to bring the whites on board. Two years later, Mandela, as president, instituted a commission of inquiry to look into racism, nepotism, and corruption in rugby controlled by the South African Rugby Federal U Feder Union, Football Union, led by a man called Louis Late, an Africana. He took the president to court saying you had no right to institute a commission. And during the court hearing and exchange of papers, his lawyers demanded that Madiba explain, and Madiba filed an, ex an affidavit under oath to show how he took that decision as the president. The defense challenged it, the prosecution challenged the, the applicants challenged it and said, we question the validity of that affidavit under oath. We want him to appear here in court, in the box, under oath, to be cross-examined. The judge was a reactionary judge from the old apartheid order, well known for his pro-apartheid views. And we were saying to Madiba, don't go to court. And he said, I'm going. And he went. And he was subjected to cross-examination. Because what the Louis Late was saying was that what you've said under oath in your affidavit is not true, meaning, you, President, you're lying. The judge, a white judge, found in favor of Louis Late, which means that the judge said that in many things that Mandela has said in the evidence, he is not credible. He didn't call him a liar, but he implied he's a liar. And the matter was taken an appeal to the Constitutional Court which overturned that judgment and ruled in favor of the government. And Mandela, when I asked him, why, why do you do this? You are in real trouble. His explanation was simple. I had to go there even though I knew that the judge was from the old order. Because in the South Africa of today, I want people to respect the administration of justice. So I subjected myself to that. And he said, I wanted to show that I'm open, that democracy is about being open, putting the facts before the people. Now, I recall this incident, colleagues, because to me, we don't have to copy that. But we have to get a guideline from that to realize that everything we say as leaders has an impact on the survival of our democracy. Everything we do has an impact. And therefore, we better count what we are doing. Because here we have a world in which some of the leaders of the most powerful countries are showing no respect for their own cause. They're doing this in a country that has a democracy for 200 years. And yet in a democracy of 24 years, we had a Mandela saying, how I conduct myself is going to be an example for people to deepen that democracy. So I, that is what, where you've taken me, uh, uh, President Encelo, by raising issues of principle as a guide, which I agree with, but I would like also to bring into the debate and discussion the question of how what you say and what you do has an enormous impact and should not be read as a sudden thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do this. It's a question of how are you going to conduct yourself today in the world in which we are living. And Mandela can't tell us what to do. 
except that we can learn from the way he did things. Mm. Well, he says, uh, okay. well, in, fact, uh, in fact, in his own words, Madiba says that uh, if 27 years in prison taught him anything, is that words matter. Mm. Uh, they can either give life or death. And, uh, and I think uh, it's, it's that lesson that we then have to take, that words matter. Um, I guess because uh, he observed that with the 27 years in prison, he had such limited time to be talking to people like uh, Mac that every time he had that opportunity, he had to be sparing in what he had to say. Be, and be careful, sure. Cello, <laughs> because in prison we had so much time we could argue about a single problem for four months at work. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the argument we had was that Millis was indigenous to Africa or was from an import into Africa. <laughs> and Madiba said, it's indigenous to Africa. And I said, it's imported. It came from the ocean, from North America. We argued for four months, and we never, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't agree. <laughs> Would now we invite we we'll open the floor to our visitors and to you, you. You are welcome to put any question to any of the members of the panel. Say, you might like this one. Just please identify yourself if you can. Um, I don't know if there's any uh, microphone. It is here. Yes, I oh. it's here. Is there a microphone there also, or am I the one with the mic? Oh, yes. go ahead. Should I take the first mic? He had it first. Uh, it's a complex way. question. I, I actually <laughs> wanted Sorry. to ask you, I, I missed the, the point of the, what came from the sea. Because, you know, in South Africa, uh, people used to call the Portuguese the Kafirs from the sea. So that was not what you were arguing about. Uh, in your story, was it? What was the thing from the sea that you were discussing before, that you <laughs> argued for four months? I do have a serious point, yeah. but please. No. What was it? And we had limited access to books. Oh. So, so we got hold of a book called The Contiki Expedition, okay. which was a boat built with using papers in Egypt, okay. and having that boat go across the Atlantic Ocean to North America. Okay, so it and was looking the at the tides. Nothing Portuguese about it that. It showed that the tides had brought corn. Okay. Well, my, my point, my point was uh, I mentioned it to Antonio just before. Um, the, um, uh, the South African Embassy made the anniversary of Mandela some uh, some weeks ago, and there was a movie there that was very impressive because of precisely the complexity. Uh, and, and you now waiting on it so much that I kind of think that uh, in concluding, of course he was complex, but there was this consistency that was driving him, and uh, this may be academic, I mean, the president knows that I've devoted my life um, to education, but the point is that uh, consistency and hope are brothers and sister, you know, and, and so you cannot isolate complex, simple, the idea is that you have to always keep going, which was, by the way, the point about the, 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 um, the hill. So, great, very moving, and uh, I'm not gonna say that, uh, but you really, your humor was, you were right to announce. Uh, <laughs> be, be careful about consistency and hope. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. No, Hitler, Hitler was also consistent. Uh, uh, no, no, <laughs> he, he had no hope, he had no hope. Hitler had no hope, you see. Yeah. Hitler had no hope. No, don't start me. Okay, I spoke for too much. Sorry, I'm up here. Over here? Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. And I mean, I just want to make more of a comment versus a, a question. And I don't want to draw any correlation to uh, Mr. Mandela, uh, sorry, Mr. Mandela, but you know we're, we're seeing similar actions in the United States right now, where you know uh, very influential individuals like Kanye West, who is uh, you know a pretty prevalent in the hip hop community, the fashion community, and uh, and the black community, kind of draw the bridge between democratic and republic, or 
black and white by a, a very similar action that Mr. Mandela did by wearing that rugby jersey onto that football field. Um, uh, Mr. West wore the Make America Great hat again um, and took a picture of it and just through his social media platforms got a ton of uh, views but also backlash. And it's very interesting because I think the media has done a really good job of creating divisiveness and, you know, separating black people from white people or, uh, you know, liberals to uh, Republicans. And I just want to kind of identify what we can do to celebrate some of these controversial Initially, they come out to be very controversial in their actions, but in the end, maybe have a greater meaning to them or have a, a, a grander message that they try to share. Because I think that's, a, that's the example that uh, uh, His Excellency, Mr. Mirage, you really pointed out when Mandela did walk out onto the field with that rugby jersey. And at the time, could have been very, very controversial. Well, it was controversial. But now we look back at it, and we, we see it as being probably a very unifying um, action back then. Um, Sorry, help me. Could you sum, sum up your question? Because it was. Sorry, I'm a bit, a bit you, said it, you said it's a comment. It's not mm -hmm. a yeah. comment. Yeah. It was can more I, of a can comment, I make a honestly. Quick question? Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I chair the United Nations Women Business Council for India, so I believe in gender equality. With your permission, I think the lady and there... there's was, also a lady oh, there. It's because think, we can barely see because case, of the we lights. We must give it to the two ladies yeah. now. So. Yeah. With uh, your permission. Right here, yeah, sure, you. of course. Well, there are, I think, three ladies even with questions. Oh, fantastic. Probably. I was uh, watching the ones there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. No, I, I was uh, thinking about um, uh, SDG 16. Uh, this is about um, inclusive uh, political uh, and, and responsive politics, uh, peace building, etc. And what always strikes me is that, like I was in New York uh, last week for a high level meeting on, on peace building, etc. The political dimension to it is never, hardly ever mentioned, responsibility of political leadership. And basically you're talking about responsibility of political leadership. And it's just not happening. C could you please comment on that? or? Just help me find a way through this maze of unwillingness to even table this in an open, proper manner. While everybody sees it, I sit in that meeting room and with me so many others thinking like, for God's sake, please just come up with it. You're responsible there. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not being said. So how can we provoke that type of leadership that you're just mentioning all the time? I think in, in, uh, one of the things that uh, we, we see is that um, citizens have given power to, too much power to politicians. And therefore, accountability is something they don't know, they don't take uh, seriously. When uh, Mamwini died, um, Bishop Mpumlwana, one of our bishops in South Africa, said uh, she's now an ancestor of active citizenship. Until such time that we have citizens wrestling power back and saying you need to account for the decisions that are made, even at uh, global bodies like the UN, um, that uh, people need to be more accountable uh, for their actions. We, we're going nowhere. Uh, and, and, uh, and unfortunately, that's, that's where we find ourselves today, where uh, political officers do not necessarily account to people. Um, and 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 that is something that needs uh, to, to change, I would say. I the, uh, and, and you asked, uh, the, the question is how? I, in South Africa, in our case, we, we, um, I, I can talk about how in, in South Africa we had uh, civic movements that would um, ensure that, um, it, it, but now there was an enemy in this case. So, the civic movements that were acting against the, the apartheid government. All that, uh, those, uh, the, the system crumbled after the enemy uh, fell apart without realizing that actually the challenge started once Madiba walked into office to make sure that you, you, you keep uh, politicians accountable, um, you fend off corruption, uh, you deal with the uh, uh, 
difficulties of education, for example, that uh, we, we have a problem with. So I think it, it starts with uh, the, the us taking responsibility of joining political parties if we so choose, of uh, aligning ourselves with uh, the, or working with NGOs that are already actively in the field um, on accountability. But thirdly, also ensuring that our voices are heard whenever we, we don't agree with uh, uh, our politicians. Because for me, that's the problem that we have, that uh, we, we're too silent for people who are concerned about where May the I just uh, come in and say, if I understood the question correctly, uh, we have a difficult problem here with the sound. I mean, there's, a, there's an echo which uh, makes things difficult. My answer to, to this uh, very interesting theme is we, not only just the South African situation, I'm not speaking about that. I'm speaking in general. The general pattern is we all love to be witnesses, but we have to be actors. That's a great difference. Mm. And it, 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 it takes a lot of risk to be act. It's much nicer to be just witness and stay as, be, as, be, as well as we can, but we can't hope that uh, society gets better. Uh, but to please a, a, a general public, which needs citizenship, needs uh, uh, the challenges, uh, uh, how are we going to respond to the challenges of uh, pluralistic societies, I think is the, how are we going to respond to the plight of refugees, it was mentioned here before, and I think it's one of the most difficult issues that our 60 million, more than 60 million people, uh, not just from war zones, uh, on the move uh, uh, in general in the world. This is a tremendous lot. We don't pay enough attention to that. Uh, I mean, you see people going to the beach and others uh, living in uh, slums uh, in the same country, in the same uh, quarter. This is a very striking uh, example of what uh, we have to overcome. So let's be, this is very easy to say, but if we are more educated, if we are more aware of what is going to, what is happening at every instance, what is the distribution, what is the, 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 the challenges that the economics of uh, globalization puts to us every day now, we have to really be uh, more active citizens. So it all comes down to liberty, democracy, citizenship, uh, as uh, uh, the person we are in fact referring to uh, mentioned. But I just wanted to uh, add, because I had the opportunity to uh, be with uh, Mr. Mandela several times, and I agree with your approach. I mean, uh, he was a very uh, charismatic and nice person. He could be hard, uh, and uh, he knew what he wanted, and that's that, full stop. Uh, and this, I think, is a characteristic of uh, uh, immense leadership. You sometimes have to cut through, provided that you keep on pursuing the mountain, I mean, and overcome the next mountain, the next mountain, because there's up and downs in life. There's nothing you can do about it. But the problem is how you resist to a downwards uh, yeah. moment and go up again and, and fight for the future. This, I think, is the great lesson and the, uh, what I would say, the, the way in which we can respond positively to this worldwide legacy, this uh, 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 gentleman, uh, I call him with great uh, tenderness, how this charismatic gentleman brought to us uh, through a life of suffering and maintaining this uh, project as it was so well uh, de demonstrated here today. I think this is coherence at the uh, Accompanied by a great, uh, by a great capacity to compromise, uh, being coherent means also uh, understanding the other, fighting for a society which is has a political and pluralistic approach. This is a great victory uh, at the end, irrespective of what is happening. This, there is an enormous challenge that makes his legacy absolutely present today. And this is why I think it's, it's important. It's, there's not many people where legacies continue to be, because he went to the uh, uh, fundamentals of society, fundamentals of how to live together, fundamentals of democracy, fundamentals of development, equality, race, 
ethnicity, religion, etc., 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 women's rights, etc., etc. The examples which were given, uh, the nationalistic, good nationalistic, national pride, as the rugby uh, example was a striking one uh, throughout the world. Uh, these are things that last and produce effects 20 years after, mm -hmm. still are producing effects. This is very decisive. Last question from a lady. Hi. I don't have a question. I have a, a comment for Mr. Maharaj. Thank you. You don't know what your words have done to me, the few words you've spoken. My father is currently in prison. He's been in prison for the last six months. He's not been convicted. He's just been arrested because of political reasons in my country. And Tanzania, I'm from Tanzania. And um, I'm going to share with him every single word you were speaking. I was trying as much as possible to write it down so I don't miss everything that you say. But I will tell him that he will come out intact, all of us. Because when you become, when you're in that environment, especially in Africa, African prisons are not pretty. They're ugly. I go there every single day for the last six months. I go take my father food every single day. And you don't know how the guard is going to be. To you, towards you, not just to your to the person inside. So all of us get affected regardless. This is the first time I've actually come out of the country. And I promised Dr. Frank I'll be here and I made sure I was here. But I've learned so much from you. You have given me so much, I don't know the right word to describe it, but my body was shivering and I could feel every hair on my body stand up as you spoke, so I just wanted to thank you. And next time the guard speaks to me in an arrogant manner, before lashing out, I'm gonna count to 10. And then hopefully something nice is gonna come out of my mouth. Thank you. Well, I'm embarrassed, but let me thank you for what you've said. And let me say to you that when we see a country and a society go into reverse gear, and particularly when we see it in Africa, it's very painful for us. And in your country, what started off as a good move seems to have slipped badly. Tanzania is our second home. It hosted us in the most difficult years. But let me also use this opportunity and your words to bring an additional dimension to the issue of responsibility and leadership. I think an active citizenry is crucial, and I think I agree with them. But I want to bring in an additional dimension that with freedom, Mandela says, comes responsibility. And when we exercise the freedom to be active, we are contributing to the building of democracy. But we must be aware what responsibility goes with that exercise of freedom. Because invariably in society, the decisions you take are intended to have certain consequences. And usually the consequences are not what you planned for. And that is when leadership emerges when you are in a mess because of the decisions you took. Usually, when that happens, and it has happened in, in South Africa, where under Mandela's leadership, we took a decision and acted on it to move for the armed struggle. And within a year, we faced obliteration as a movement. We were wiped out in the country. We survived in Tanzania. But at that moment, there will be people who will stand up and cry and say who to blame. That's not a leader. They vanish. The leader is the one who takes responsibility for those consequences mm -hmm. and sits down and says, this is where we are now. How do we as a people move forward? And he begins to chart. That responsibility <coughs> means you have to participate in shaping the way forward. Not in who to blame, but how to move forward. That is a critical element of everything we do, and it applies to you even in business. 
There are many things you do in your own business where you could see it did not realize the profits and gains you wanted. The question was, do you blame who made the mess and try to take away responsibility from yourself? Or do you take responsibility and say, now, how do we move forward? That is what I wanted to add, because I think the issue is beyond just action and activity. It is we have to take responsibility for the state of our society. The, where we are in this democracy, in this world, this crisis, is not to formulate the question by saying, democracy has failed us. The correct question is to recognize we have failed democracy. Yep. Decisions, decisions, we are already over the time. I'm just going to ask, because it was a previous comprom compromise, ask Mr. David Nosben. He's from the Elders Council. It, it's an heritage that Madiva left us. Uh, what is your role in our days in a few minutes, and what is the challenge that you leave to us? Uh, thank you. So I'm David Nussbaum. My job is being chief executive of the secretariat that supports the work of the elders. Many of you will not have heard, heard of the elders. Well, 12 years ago, or thereabouts, the entrepreneur Richard Branson and the musician Peter Gabriel were bemoaning the state of the world. I wonder what they think of it now. Um, and they thought the world could benefit from having a group of global elders in the way that an African village might have its elders. Not the people running the show, but people who might speak to the people running the show and might listen to what the villagers are saying. And so Richard Branson and Peter Gabriel got a meeting with Nelson Mandela and after quite a time persuaded him to pull together after a long process of selection a group of 12 global elders. And so on Mandela's 89th birthday, uh, he launched this group, uh, chaired by Archbishop Tutu. Uh, it included President Jimmy Carter, Kofi Annan, uh, who's now the chair, so my boss. Um, now the elders consist of, uh, well, Kofi Annan, Ban Ki-moon, and the former president or uh, prime ministers of Chile, Mexico, Ireland, Norway, Finland, the former foreign minister of Algeria, uh, and Grasa Michelle, Mandela's widow. What do the elders do? They do political advocacy. They don't have power, they don't have an army, they can't impose trade sanctions, but they can write, they can speak, they can phone, they can meet, they can see, they can publish, they can uh, call out. Uh, and over the last year, we've celebrated 10 years of the elders with a, uh, a campaign called Walk Together, Continue Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom focusing on themes of peace, health, justice, and equality. And that campaign will culminate on the 18th of July this year when uh, Cello and uh, his organization are leading, uh, or involved in leading the celebrations of Mandela's uh, centenary. But that, that phrase, the long walk to freedom, is important, isn't it? It's a long walk. It takes time. And it's a walk. The image is Mo Farah, not Usain Bolt. If you want to find out more, you can look online. But I leave you with a thought that came up in the, the, the conversation the panel had, and that is the importance of hope. Uh, Archbishop Tutu, the first chair of the elders, had a phrase. He used to talk about being a prisoner of hope. And I think we need to keep all of us, that sense of being prisoners of hope uh, to maintain commitment to democracy and to uh, positive development in the world. Thank you. Thank you. On a final note, nothing better than uh, borrowing from Mac's extensive experience on, on communicating on Madiba's heritage and also I'll ask him to close this conference with a very personal address to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm aware of the time factor, but in conclusion, I'd like to say something that 
We focus on Mandela, the icon. We focus on the pain that he went through. But when we have reminisced in retirement, it's on record that he and I arrived at a different conclusion. And recently I was asked by people at the foundation to contribute a very short piece on remembering Mandela. And I'd like to close by drawing attention to a small part of that, which I'd like to read out. I said there that I remember how, in that cold and soul-deadening loneliness of the prison cell, Mandela wrapped himself in a blanket, sat motionless and expressionless when he learned that on different occasions of the death of his mother, of the passing of his son, Tembi, and of the torture that Comrade Winnie, his wife, was subjected to in detention without trial in 1969. I remember these moments because while many know of the brutalities, both physical and psychological, that we detainees and prisoners experienced and admire us for surviving, few know that the greater pain that we underwent was the agony, the suffering, and the torture our families outside prison, our spouses and our children were undergoing. I remember because no matter the torture that I bore in detention in 1964, it was the assault in detention of my then wife, Tim, by a warrant officer, Erasmus, that I could not endure. It was a different kind of pain compounded by a sense of utter helplessness. It turned forever the iron in me into steel. I remember a rare moment when Mandela almost assaulted a warder for denigrating his wife, Winnie. And I remember those moments of pain and helplessness that were visited upon Mandela and understood how they planted within us an everlasting sense of guilt that we failed our families when they needed us most that the honor of serving the cause of freedom belongs to them, not to the Mandelas and me. When, and I ask the question, when shall we bring the deeds of those members of our family out from the sh shadows and a shine a light on them? Thank you. Thank you so much. I would just like to make a quick announcement. We would like to invite you all to join us at the welcome reception at the Hotel Palacio. Just follow the signs and my colleagues will lead you there. Thank you very much.